Squares Fielder. He's gone to the dogs. More edition of the Gone to the Dogs podcast. Today, we're in for a special treat because I have a longtime friend that I haven't spoken to in too many years uh, from the great state of Florida, uh, Martha Brown. Martha, how are you today? I'm great, Stephen. How are you? Um, well, I'm doing great. I, I uh, you know, the old saying is, you know, if I'd known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. But uh, for a guy that's up there, uh, got his three score and 10 plus five, <laughs> you mathematicians out there uh, that didn't have common core, you might be able to figure that out. But at any rate, uh, I'm just uh, very, very happy to be able to do this podcast thing because I get to m- talk to so many interesting people. And listeners, uh, I want you to know that you're in for a real treat today as we talk with Martha. Uh, now, that n- nice voice that you hear on the other microphone is uh, might fool you a bit. Uh, because this is one, or back in the day, maybe still is, one of the hardest hunters that I uh, was to meet down here in the Deep South. And I'm just so anxious to talk to her about her coon hunting experiences uh, in the state of Florida, uh, not only uh, from a Floridian standpoint, but also from the standpoint of a woman who's been very much involved in coon hunting. And uh, I know she likes her walker dogs, and we're going to talk about all of that. Martha, if you would, for our uh, audience today, would you just give me a little backstory, a little uh, background, if you will, about where you were born, where you live now? Uh, I understand that you're still working and uh, anything about your family or any personal uh, aspects there that would uh, help our listeners to know who you are. Okay. Well, I was born in a little town called Dothan, Alabama. It's in the forest south of Alabama near the Florida line. And uh, I grew up, my daddy loved to hunt. And his the thing he loved the most was bird hunting. Uh, his brother-in-law had a big farm in Haleburg, Alabama, and I remember as a little girl going with him and watching the bir- the dogs work in the field. Um, my brother loved to hunt with my dad, but he wanted to, he, he'd rather deer hunt than bird hunt, but I, I never was that interested in shooting the birds as I was just watching the dogs. I loved to watch those dogs work the field, and Uncle Herschel was really knowledgeable about bird hunting. He, in 1967 or 68, I think, he had a dog named Festus, a pointer, liver-colored pointer, that won some big field trial in Alabama. And I remember how excited my dad was. And and that was sort of my first introduction, if you will, about actually being able to compete with how well your dog did. And I think that stuck with me. Mm -hmm. Um, I've... I finished um, nursing at George Wallace Community College in Dothan and married and moved to Florida, to Panama City, Florida. And my husband also deer hunted, and they used to use dogs back then. They used to do a lot of dog hunting in Florida. We had so much land, um, International Paper Company land, just millions of acres. I mean, you could almost start your dog at the Gulf and run Mm -hmm. all the way to the Alabama-Florida line. And so um, we always had hounds, uh, just mixed, a little bit of beagle, a little bit of blue tick, a little bit of July, if you know what that is. Oh, yeah, (laughs) foxhound blood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the emphasis was always more on the game than it was on the dogs. You know, they weren't interested in bloodlines. If a French poodle would run a deer out in front (laughs) of them, they'd use that. Sure. Um, around 1990, I guess, I met a man named Fred Nelson. I actually met him at the hospital. Uh, he was a patient, and uh, he introduced me to coon hunting. And uh, wow. I don't know, it was just one of those things I've always told people, with coon hunting, there is no 
lukewarm. You either don't like it or you are obsessed with it. Yeah. And for some reason, that bug just bit me. I mean, it did. And uh, Fred had an old dog named Smokey. He was a grade dog. And it wasn't until years later that I really appreciated how good he was. I just didn't know it that much about coon hunting. He was old. He was a mouse color and white dog with t- tan cheeks and had an old ball mouth uh, track and tree, cold nose. Mm. And uh, Fred and I'd go to the woods with him. And Fred was an older man. He couldn't really go to the tree. So I'd go to the tree and get Fred, and (laughs) here I was. I was in hiking boots with a flashlight. I didn't have any (laughs) of the gear. This was in the early 90s, Um, and Fred was hard of hearing, so if I got too deep and hollered, he couldn't hear me. Uh, I'd get lost, wet, uh, briar burn, stumble into yellow jacket nest. I mean, I had to have loved it because otherwise I would have quit. Well, you know, when you and I first met, I believe was at the UKC Winter Classic in Albany, Georgia. Was that is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and I just remember your energy, and uh, I said, "Okay, here's a lady that r- really, if I met her on the street, the last thing I would think that is that she's a coon hunter." But yet here she is. She's uh, at by that point, you were all decked out in the. And the the uniform of the day, so to speak, with the boots, right. bibs, I, I, I believe, or maybe or maybe not. But anyway, you looked the part of a coon hunter. And I could see the energy that was there with you. And as we spoke, I knew that you knew from, uh, you know, from experience, uh, you knew the sport and all. So, but so those. So you just kind of out of the blue with this one guy that had this old uh, great, uh, apparently a great dog, or was he a walker dog? He was a walker dog, but he didn't have papers on him. Mm -hmm. Um, He was just a great dog. He may have had something else besides walker in him, but he was mostly walker. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, that's, I know, uh, a stretch, and I'm not sure I could answer this question but do you recall the first time that you heard a dog uh, run in tree? Of course, you had heard running dogs with the deer dogs, right. I'm sure. But uh, no, the, uh, yeah, I didn't have any idea about the changeover from strike to tree when they locate. I didn't know any of that. You know, I'd be sitting out there talking to Fred, and Fred would say, "Well, Smokey's tree. Let's see if we can drive around there and get a little bit closer," um, because I wasn't involved in any kind of competition hunting. I didn't even know competition hunting for raccoons even existed back then. Mm -hmm. This was just an older man that didn't live very far from me. And while he was recuperating from his surgery, I had gone over to feed his hounds and clean out the kennels because his wife just really, you know, they were, they were an older couple and that was kind of hard for her to do. And uh, we all called him Uncle Fred. He he had a lot of hunters that, younger hunters that hung out at his house. Mm. It, it was kind of a, uh, just a meeting place. There was a couple of guys that coyote hunted with hounds and some deer hunted, but it was just, kind of, he was a houndsman. And we just kind of hang out at his house. And I, I didn't know any of the ins and outs of coon hunting then. Um, Eventually, one of his friends gave me a dog that was registered, and his name was um, his name was Luke. And Luke went back to Dahoney's Ringo, which, uh, of course, that didn't mean anything to me again at the time. But uh, I got Luke. He was already trained. Uh, he was the first registered dog I had. And I found out that there were competition events. I joined a local coon hunting club that we had it was a panhandle sportsman's club in southport florida which wasn't very far from it was just up the road from panama city and i started competition hunting and uh i I would say that luke was the first dog that sort of introduced me into the world of competition hunting Mm -hmm. and you know being a woman in this sport i never 
encountered any problem. I really didn't. Um, I had a lot of guys that sort of took me under their wing when I had Luke and first started competition hunting. Um, I made some bad calls. I didn't really know how to call him. I, I wasn't even really that interested back then in winning as much as I was just enjoying the whole idea of mm. being a part of a competition event. Boy, and, if we uh, could convince uh, the hunters today that first come into the sport to come in with that attitude, we, we would be eons ahead of where we are because oh, I think won. out of the box – uh, winning becomes the be all end all, you know, for so many mm -hmm. people. But, um, well, that, that's amazing. I want to, uh, you struck a nerve there, not a nerve, but uh, uh, a recollection for me when you mm -hmm. talked about um, Uncle Fred and having uh, hunters gather around at his place and all. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Mr. Frank Martin up in Ozark, Alabama. I knew Back Frank and the, the, and the Parkers. The Parker boys that hunted mm -hmm. for him and all. I uh, went to Mr. Frank's place there a couple of times, and, um, you know, and, and he had a cabin there right mm -hmm. on his sure did. Uh, property. And, uh, yeah, I guess you probably remember that then. That's, yeah. that's great. But that just uh, immediately came to mind to me, and uh, and, and so many uh experiences over the years where there was an older hunter that kind of kept the group together that the group kind of looked to you know as being uh oh i don't know I, out of respect i guess and and realization that these older fellows and i'm not trying to to say i'm one but uh had you know something to share something to give mm -hmm. And, uh, but that was just kind of cool when you mentioned that. I, it, it reminded me so much of, of going up to Mr. Frank's there years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember going to hunts up there and there would always be, uh, people that even, that weren't even going to hunt. They were just, they just show up and they had some of the funniest stories that they would tell <laughs> about coon hunting. Oh yeah. Yeah. But I, I enjoyed that too. Yeah, there was a, a, a Purina rep back in those days, uh, Les Rogers. I don't know mm -hmm. if you ever met Les. He was a blue tick guy. But he was the first one to take me to Mr. Frank's. And, uh, okay. Yeah, and of course, Les loved a good story and had a good time. And, all. and I hope he's doing well. I haven't talked to him in years and years. Uh, well, okay, we kind of jumped into the competition a little bit, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, you know, the ver uh, the very first time you went hunting, was it with Mr. Fred? Was that our Uncle Fred? Yeah, it was. And like I said, he was an older man and couldn't go to the tree. Right. And right. so he'd sit out in the truck and, and me and, and there were a couple other uh, young people that, you know, there were mark and dane they were younger than me um they thought they wanted to try coon hunting they were already deer hunters and uh <laughs> it was funny we, we'd go the tree none of us took a compass reading none of us paid any attention we'd just go the dog and turn around and come back out sometimes we'd be way down the road from where fred's <laughs> truck was I mean, we we, yeah. we were clueless yeah. and uh they decided that wasn't for them. It was just a little bit too, uh, I, I just loved it. I mean, I did. I'd sometimes be out there all by myself. And um, my husband, bless his heart, he is the world's best husband in the world because <laughs> he loved to deer hunt. But his thing on coon hunting was, okay, I just hacked and clawed and chewed my way through some of the worst woods in the world to get to a tree. And I look up there, and there's a coon. Okay, great. I can't eat it. I can't mount it. What's the What's the point? <laughs> well, I was going to ask you about that because you know, with your family and all, what mm -hmm. What did they think overall? Did you have children at this time? I did. Uh -huh. I had two of two of the girliest girl daughters. I was always <laughs> a tomboy, and they could have cared less. Yeah. Um, but. You know, they just knew that was mom's thing, and mm -hmm. and I never, I never let it interfere 
with my family. You know, sure. if I had a weekend free, I coon hunted, but I always put my family first. Uh, mm. I always used to dream about being able to go to these big hunts out of state, and but I just never really could do that. I the Winter Classic because it was close. You know, I hunted that, but. Mm -hmm. And the Florida State hunt, the Georgia State hunt, and the Alabama State hunts, I could make those hunts. But I never really got to go and hit the road and compete like I wanted uh, to. Because when you're a mom, you just can't do that. Oh, I'm sure. Well, you know, from my standpoint, having worked at the registries all those years, I missed a lot of weekend activities with my family, you know, and mm -hmm. I spoke um, all fairly recently with Alan Gingrich at UKC, and we're talking about the number of weekends that are involved in a job like that, and mm -hmm. and uh, he also has Beagle events that he attends and all, and I, I remember those days. We, you know, started a Beagle program. We started a retriever program and all of those things. There were so many times that we were away from uh you know, away from the uh, family uh, out there on the road. Mm -hmm. But uh, I always, like you, you know, I always made it a point that when I would, wasn't working, that if it, there was a family activity, I always put that first. And right. I think a person's wise to do that. And, uh, you know, I have one son. And one only, and he coon hunted a lot with me when he was a kid. But as he got older, basketball came along and his friends, and he learned to play guitar and he loved to do that. And different things came along that took the place of hunting. And so he's really not a coon hunter. But um, I just wondered, you know, from that, that mm -hmm. standpoint, how your family, uh, you know, reacted to your hunting they were activities. they were very supportive they were mm -hmm. very supportive i think they thought i was nuts but they were very <laughs> supportive but yeah i had luke for about a year and then i won my first hunt was in ashford alabama i will never forget that i was i think it was more everybody else just made more mistakes than i did but for whatever reason i i won my hunt my and, and then then i i got more competitive after that my uh husband came home one day with an English dog named Chance. One of his friends was uh, with the Boilermakers Union and had done a, a shutdown in Texas. And he had mm -hmm. gone out there and, and got, a, got into coon hunting out in Texas and came back to Florida with a puppy, an English puppy, and then didn't want to do it anymore. So he gave it to my husband. And this was my first chance to and that's why i named the dog chance to actually train a coon hound myself and uh we learned together um i i bought john wick's book on training coon hounds and went from there and uh luckily i didn't mess him up too bad he was a very he was a he was a funny dog when you turn the dogs loose on a cast the other dogs would just take off and he reminded me of a businessman who would pick up his briefcase and just go to work. Then he used to tree raccoons behind the other dogs because they'd just take off. And he'd yeah. just walk in there and hit a tree. Uh, he was a good layup dog. Um, he was the steadiest tree dog. He had this cadence when he'd tree like a heartbeat. Yeah. And he didn't jump, he didn't gnaw, he didn't face bark, he didn't change that cadence. He'd just pick a spot on the tree and just tree. <laughs> and if you had to drive around to get closer to him, whatever the cadence was when you got in your truck and you got out, same thing. Um, yeah. He was just a... And in 1996, I placed ninth in the Winter Classic, registered with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, that sort of solidified to myself and to the people I hunted with that even though I was a woman, I I had a pretty good knowledge of what I was doing because right. I trained in myself and then, you know, one one in a big hunt like that. And it, it opened doors for me. Um Tommy Davis was president of the Florida Coon Hunters Association and asked me to be the secretary treasurer of right. that. And uh 
you know, I, I got involved in that. And that's when I met you because we were petitioning, trying to get the Florida State Hunt, a Purina Points event. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, Chance, yes. Chance was a neat dog. And uh, I met a young man named Mike Lovett at one of our hunts. Um, I think it was a Florida State Hunt. And I was impressed with his dog. He also had an English dog. And I got a female off of him. Uh, her name was Peach. And she had probably the best handle on her of any dog I ever hunted. And that's when I started doing a lot of hunting by myself. Because, you know, because you hunt in Florida, you know what I mean when you say there are some places you just don't want to go into by yourself. Oh, absolutely. I want to stop right there just a second mm -hmm. because I wanted to ask you this question earlier on. Mm -hmm. I see from time to time on Facebook or other social media people talking about guys that are afraid of the dark. They will only go hunting with someone else. They won't go catch their dog at the end of the hunt if they have to go by themselves. Now, typically, a woman would be afraid in the daytime to venture out into a Florida swamp, palmettas over your head, uh, cat claw briars, or uh, right. what do you call those things? Uh, uh, Johnny Brinkley, you, you know the Brinkleys very well, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he calls them tie-dyes or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, tie-dyes. It's a mess. And then you have these things. I call them gotcha vines because <laughs> they'll, they'll get you. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, from even the er earliest introductions, um, mm -hmm. were you unafraid to be out there in the woods by yourself? You know, growing up the way I did, um, my mother was a teacher. And in the summers, we spent a lot of time at my grandmother's house. She lived in Webb, Alabama, which is just outside of Dothan on a farm. And we just ran wild as kids. We were always in the woods, me and my brother and my cousins, um, in the dark, during the day. Uh, we just, there was never anything in the woods that I was afraid of. Snakes didn't bother me, you know, reptiles. That The only thing I don't like are cockroaches. I, I'll just run <laughs> screaming out of a room if, if there's a cockroach in there, but I don't have anything to well, do Well, we have those. those nice ones that the Yankees, uh, pardon me, the people from up north mm -hmm. call palmetto bugs. Yeah, well, whatever you want to call them when they fly at you, I'm out of there. Yeah, yeah. But, no, I just, um, I don't know. They're just... I never was afraid of the woods. I was at home in the woods. I, I just wasn't an urban girl at all. I was a country girl. And mm -hmm. and growing up, when I did, you know, there was no fear of just letting your children run loose. You know, people didn't oh, yeah. worry about somebody snatching your children off the road. Uh, so mm -hmm. we'd leave in the morning and we'd be gone all day in the woods yeah. somewhere with a cane pole fishing or, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Well, you know, I grew up like that too, uh, Martha. You know, I grew up on the edge of a little town. Well, it was a fair-sized town. It became about 20,000 people, I think, eventually. But, you know, when we would go to my grandmother's farm in Tennessee, I had uh, two cousins the same age as me, plus a, a farm kid up the road that was also our age. And the whole time that we were there on a vacation, probably two weeks maybe, we did exactly what you said. We ran wild in the woods. You know, there was a creek mm -hmm. there. We could swim in the creek. Uh, everybody learned to swim at an early age, so our parents weren't really afraid that we were going to drown or whatever. We, right. we were doing all kinds of things. And my grandmother, who was a teacher too, which you mm -hmm. bring that up, she had taught in a one-room school, uh, and then after that, raised a family of nine kids on a little 80-acre farm in Tennessee, and she used to always mm -hmm. say, when I would be afraid as a kid, a small kid, to go outside, which you had to do in those days if you wanted to go to the bathroom, because that's where the bathroom was. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an outside affair. And she'd say, Stephen? 
There's nothing out there in the dark that's not there in the daytime. And she would always tell me that. Well, I'm not so sure I bought all that because I, you know, but no, I was never afraid of the dark or afraid to go to my dog. And even today, I would love to hunt more by myself. But I know with my age and and some health issues that I've had uh, over the over the years, it's not a good idea for me to do that. But it's right. just interesting to me that that you, as a woman, uh, are apparently not not afraid of the dark, are you? <laughs> no, no. In yeah. fact, I have some. There's one thing, one memory that stands out when I was hunting peach one night. That if you'd had other people with you, these things would never happen. It was in January, and it was bitterly, bitterly cold. I almost didn't go because it was so cold. But I knew if I went to the tree, I'd warm up. So. We went, and I turned her loose in a big area where there was a cypress pond. It's a big pond, but it's clean once you get in it. And uh, she treed. And I went in there, and it had been a little cloudy. And about the time I got to where it, uh, the brush started clearing out, and you get that picture of that just wide-open cypress mm-hmm. pond with the mm-hmm. cypress trees in it, the moon came out. And mm-hmm. here was peach up on a tussock on this big old dead cypress and right up in the very top of it just you could almost see it without your light was the coon and it was so cold and so still you know those nights where it's so still Mm -hmm. there's no air and the stars were all out and it was the most beautiful picture you know there i didn't have a phone or a camera or anything i couldn't capture it but it was it was things like that when you're by yourself, you know, and it taught me too the way a hound can talk to you with their voice. When when you're out on mm. the road and they're deep in the woods and you're by yourself, you're not um your attention is completely on the dog. You're not distracted. And so I that's when I really begin to learn my dog's voice. I could just about tell you every single thing that dog was doing just by mm. the, the voice that they were using. And and I remember those years I had Peach. Um, that's when I really began to, I guess it really began to all start to click. Everything just fell into place. What, you know, the beauty of coon hunting, the, the competitiveness of it, knowing your dog, all of that just kind of fell into place with her. And I bred her to chance. But none of the puppies panned out. I just, I don't know. They just, sometimes I think that happens. And also, mm-hmm. too, with breeding, I wasn't yet there where it came to understanding the different bloodlines and what traits are in the different bloodlines. And if you desire certain traits, you know, I was learning to coon hunt, but I still had a long way to go when it came to breeding or that type of thing. Mm-hmm. So. I had these puppies, and they weren't doing that good. And that's when I met a man named Leroy Eason. And I'm telling you, that man has forgotten more about coon hunting than most people will ever know. Well, tell us a little bit more about him. Where is he from, and is he still living? No, he died a year Mm -hmm. ago of cancer. Oh, Um, I'm sorry. But he was the most, he was from here in Panama City. He was born and raised here. Um. He was born and raised in Southport, where I, that I mentioned earlier, where mm-hmm. our coon hunting club was. Um, he was the one that turned me on to the second line. He had always liked Frank Giddings' dogs. When I met him, he had a dog named Rocky Rose that I believe she was off Rock River Banjo, but I'm not 100% sure about that. But he mm-hmm. liked that line of dogs. But he's the only person that gave me grief in the beginning about being a woman it was uh sort of <laughs> like if you're gonna run with the big dogs you got to get off the porch yeah um you know that type of thing but right. um he he got a dog he had a friend named dennis graham who mm-hmm. was a bear hunter and you know back then or back in the day you could bear hunt in florida with right hounds. right correct and dennis was a contractor he worked work in michigan in the summer and he'd come down to Panama City and work in the winter because you couldn't do anything in Michigan. He lived in the 
UP of Michigan up mm -hmm. in uh, Boyne, uh, Boyne Falls um, area. Okay. And uh, uh, B O Y N E, I think. Yeah, is Boyne. How you spell it. There's a Boyne, Boyne uh, I think it's called Boyne Mountain or whatever. That's a very desirable area for people to to have a went uh you know a summer home up on mm -hmm. uh, well, he on had the a lake. place up in Boyne Falls, which is a little town I guess somewhere up that way, but um he knew Frank Giddings mm -hmm. and uh he had he sent he sent a real good friend of his teenage son down one summer. He brought him down with him and the boy had been in some trouble and the father wanted him out of the situation. And so Leroy and I kind of took this kid under our wing and coon hunted with him all summer. And in thanks for that, um, the man sent Leroy a puppy off Sackett Jr. And his, mm -hmm. he was off uh, Sackett Jr. And um, let's see, grab this real quick. Um, oh, you got files. Huh? <laughs> you have files there that we can Well, consult. I just was looking for this pedigree. He was <laughs> off of. Uh, Kentucky River Candy, Lee Curran's dog. Yes, uh huh. And uh, I remember that candy. cross. I remember okay. when uh, when Lee made that cross. Yeah. Okay. Well, we got Elmo, and Johnny Brinkley and Jake Lewis got a dog named Ratchet, which was I mm -hmm. think Elmo's brother. But Elmo, from the minute I was in the woods with that dog, there was something different about him. There was just this presence i don't know that's the only word i can use it because when you turned him loose something was going to happen uh he would find a coon um and he was just and he would run a coon you'd think he was running a deer the way he'd run a coon and uh he he got a female named roxanne off a man named buddy uh buddy kelly and mm -hmm. roxanne's mother was a dog named Kelly Sandy, and Sandy was off a uh, uh, tree gem and buck. Yeah, she was off buck. She was a very well, she was an excellent dog. He finished her out to Grand Night. Um, I think she was probably about 15 months old when he finished mm. her out to Grand Night, but she ended up, Bob Dudley bought her. Right. But we made the cross between Sandy and, uh, or excuse me, Roxanne and Elmo, and that's where my Jetta female came from. And she was the best dog I ever owned. Uh, my grandson won the AKC Florida State Hunt with her. I finished her out to a grand and to a PKC champion. And if I'd been able to hit the road and campaign her, I, I really believe she would have made a name for herself. She was just what was it about her? Her energy. Uh -huh. um, I would take her out of the box sometimes on a hunt, and she would be up on her hind legs, bunny hopping with her nose in the air. She could win the coon, and I used to hate it when the guide would say, now we're going to turn loose down this ditch. She said, we don't want them to go the other way. Because <laughs> guess where we were going? Yeah. Because if I took her out of the box and the wind was right and she winded something over there, that's where she was going. Mm -hmm. She she was just an extraordinary dog. She um she died in twenty twenty. Wow! But, so um, you had she her. Was, um, yeah, she was sixteen years old. Mm, that's amazing. So she was uh, going back. Is that primarily Sackett Junior breeding? Uh, or just on one side? No, she she is kind of on both sides, really. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I second. yeah. Well, okay. So um, the competition thing, your experiences with it. Um, mm -hmm. You said you placed ninth at the Winter Classic, and and it always uh, kind of makes me feel good when I hear somebody mention the Winter Classic because. You know, I remember the days when Fred Miller and I were looking for a spot for that. And mm -hmm. we were, I often tell people who were on nine airplanes in two days. Uh, we were on nine airplanes in two days trying to find yeah. the right location. And uh, 
we settled on Albany, Georgia, when we drove out to the community center out there, the South Dardery Community Center, and Fred Miller saw that tree line drive and that clubhouse down at the end of it. It looked like right. something out of the, the deep south, you know, and a uh, plantation type thing. And he said, I think this is the spot, Steve. And uh, and so we started that hunt and had a great run there. And, uh, and as they say, they're all Benny and uh, many, many great memories there. But so anyway, that was that was a good uh, – uh, what was it like for you to go to the uh, Winter Classic back in those oh, days? Oh, I will never forget. The first time I drove up, now I was used to, we had a club in Chipley, Florida. And Chipley used to hold its uh, hunts at the Agriculture Center. And we'd have a lot of dogs there, especially when we had our state hunt. But I was totally not prepared for how many trucks. When I drove up to... Uh, um, especially after it moved to the fairgrounds there in Albany. Right. It was just so many. I, it was huge. Uh, <laughs> I was probably walking around with my mouth open for most of the time. Um, I hunted it for several years before I finally placed in it. Um, I took Luke up there after I had won my hunt with him in, in a uh, Ashford, Alabama. I took him up there, but I, I didn't win my cast with him. He was a pretty good dog, but he wasn't really a good competition dog. Um, but yeah, and I hunted Peach up there one time too. Didn't do anything with her either, but I got lucky with Chance. Um, we The satellite club was Waycross, mm -hmm. so we went over to Waycross to hunt, and they had gotten huge amounts of rain over there, like two or three days before the hunt. And uh, it was a good thing I had a change of clothes because we we were we were wading in water waist deep in some places. Mm -hmm. But uh, Welcome to the South, right? Yep, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, you know, as you speak about the Winter Classic, I can remember the anxiety that I felt, you know, after we picked this location. And mm -hmm. we really didn't have uh, the infrastructure and all out at that community center. We had to rent a, uh, what I call a circus tent to have mm -hmm. our bench show under and to call our casts and so forth, especially uh, to keep out of that Florida, uh, that uh, Georgia sun and also mm -hmm. uh, if it rained. and. Right. Um, as it did at times down there. So we really didn't know what to expect. And we got out there, you know, and walked off the vendor spaces out there behind the clubhouse and all. And we were so hopeful. And then that first year when those trucks started rolling in, you know, mm -hmm. it was just, <laughs> it was a sigh of relief. And it was also uh, very, very uh, uh, gratifying, you know, to say, well, it looks like, we're off to a pretty good start here, and right. and we were, and it was there for three years, I think, before we did uh, decide that you know we're going to be in trouble if we get real bad weather out here. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't have any place to put these people under roof and the dogs under roof and all that, all of that. So, and man, what a great relationship we had with the Exchange Club of Albany. Um, I know, and they do such a a wonderful job there working with uh, abused children and mm -hmm. all and and just what a great bunch of guys and and all going into that dining hall <laughs> there and getting a piece of that pecan pie. I call it pecan. What do you call it? Pecan or or pecan? No, pecan. Pecan, pecan okay. pie. You remember, I'm from Alabama. That's so. right. That's right. But, oh, man, I mean, it was uh, it was a great, great experience there. And that's where we had our, when we, I started that uh, Don't Shoot My Dog campaign, and we gave out mm -hmm. the little empty collar pins, and we would have our, uh, uh, you know, Canine Awareness Network meeting there. And I won't bore our listeners with a lot of that, but those of you out there that are listening that were there, you'll have to agree with me, and I'm sure with you, Martha, that that was yeah. just a really, was really you know, a fun time. We missed that 
hunt being in Albany here in Florida because, you know, we've always said in Florida that we always kind of felt like we were the coon hunt hound world stepchild. People yeah. didn't want to come to Florida and hunt. And I remember way back when, when the world hunt was divided up into regions and you mm-hmm. had to go to whatever um, state the mm-hmm. regional uh, hunt was going to be in after you won an RQE, you go right. to the zone semifinals. Mm-hmm. And I remember it was time for Florida, it would rotate and it was time for Florida to host the zone semifinals. And UKC wanted to bypass us because they said too many people didn't want to come to Florida. And Arnold Moore went to bat for us. <laughs> and My said buddy that, Nubbin. Yeah. yeah. He said that we deserved a shot. And uh, I tell you, you talk about all of the people that you came to care so much about at Albany. What a good group that was. Um, what was the guy's name that was the head of the... Albany Club, Jimmy Phillips. Jimmy Phillips. Yeah, Jimmy. Jimmy was a great guy. Yes, uh, I took Jimmy with me to AKC. I stole him away from UKC (laughs) when I started there. He he first was Lindell Price, and then Mm -hmm. uh, and of course Lindell was down there and judged the first show. And uh, yeah, there's so many great great memories from there. Yeah. Well, I had the same kind of of relationship with the club in Perry, Florida. Mm-hmm. That's where we hosted our zone semifinals. That's where we usually had the Florida State hunt. And especially when it was the, when that when that hunt became a Purina Points hunt, we would we could put a hundred dogs in the woods without even mm-hmm. batting an eye. Perry had so many woods around there. And Robert Swain had built a I was a just gonna mention area. Mr. Swain, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, Wayne Hunter, Wayne and Janice and Johnny and Laquita Brinkley, all those people that Danny Williams, all of those people, we, we used to put on a top notch state no doubt. down there. No doubt. And I loved those people around Perry that the hunters that would guide, they knew the woods, they could keep you on top of your dogs. Um, it was just, a, it was a, a, for five years we did that every year and, and it was, I really enjoyed that. That that was a mm. real treat for me to go down there for those hunts. Well, you know, Florida desperately needs uh, an event like that to bring the coon hunting community back together. I was just yeah. on the phone today with Gary Langford, who is the PKC yeah. state president. And Gary has worked, people don't realize this, but behind the scenes in this sport are a lot of good people working really hard to to try to produce some good things for coon hunters. Mm-hmm. And I think many times they the hunters themselves don't realize it or don't appreciate it. And that's one of the things that kind of gets under my skin a bit because I know how hard, you know, Gary has worked tirelessly to try to get some of these wildlife management areas opened up to night mm-hmm. hunting. So many of them will, will permit deer dog uh, hunting in the daytime, but there's some kind of stigma with hunting at night that, you know, it's it's a tough one to get by sometimes. But Gary's working very hard uh, yeah. now, and, and although, you know, he's kind of slowed down a little bit, I think, from his personal quest in the hunts, uh, he does still competition hunt. But anyway, mm-hmm. that's a little little rabbit path we went down there. But, yeah, yeah I can remember the days at Perry. And I, as I travel up Highway 19 and go up that way now, you know, as I head up to Nubbin Moore's place in, in Alabama, I'm always reminded. Right. Uh, we used to send a uh, cast down to Chipley from mm-hmm. from Albany and uh, also yeah. to Thomasville. Woody McCorkle always was faithful. I know he started the Sunshine Jamboree, and some people say, yeah. well, he— you know, he's taking the hunters away from the Winter Classic. Well, not really, because his hunt started on Thursday night mm-hmm. and was that way for a long time. But I could always, always depend on Woody to show up and say, I've got you five judges for tonight. I don't care. No. I, I would set my watch by Woody McCorkle's word on that. So, uh, yeah, it's great, great yeah. memories you uh, you bring 
bring for me, uh, Martha. I really do. Uh, well, those were those were good days, and back then, people, the the hunters, when they brought a dog to the hunt, they knew their dog. They knew how to call their dog. Mm -hmm. uh, right before I quit coon hunting, the these younger hunters, if they didn't have their electronics with them, they wouldn't know where their dog was, what they were doing, or how to get out of the woods. Um, well, well, sadly, that's true in many cases, and that's one of the things that we tried to do with these podcasts is kind of try to urge these kids to put the electronics down and listen to your dog and learn your dog. And, mm -hmm. and if you could convince them to discipline themselves enough to say, well, I'm only going to take this out of my pocket if my dog's out of hearing and I don't have a clue where he is and I need right. to know where he is then I can look and see. But otherwise, keep it in your pocket and uh, and learn. You know, right. can't yeah. preach that enough, but I don't know. Well, I don't think, I don't know if we're getting through or not. It's the age, and I, they're probably not going to do that because what was it they're trying to get past now where the, um, uh, when you find the coon using the electronic device to find the, the, the thermal the imager. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. yeah, thermal imaging and GPS and knowing whether or not your dog's treeing by looking at your machine. And I don't know. You know, I never did have a GPS. I was still using my MM10 receiver <laughs> and my tracking collars, and I never lost a dog. And yeah, yeah, I couldn't tell you what track my dog followed, you know, but I was listening to my dog. I knew mm -hmm. where my dog was. Um, I'm not knocking it. I'm not knocking it. It's a generational thing. Uh, well, it is. And, and, you know, I think about that a lot, um, uh, uh, about how the younger people, uh, but you know, it's hard to get the grandkids off of the, the, the Nintendo and the uh, I was Xbox lucky. and all that stuff. And yeah, but, uh, I didn't have my, any of that. My son, when he came along, I think it's about, well, when he was a teenager, that's when these devices, you know, started mm -hmm. coming along. But I have a grandson that is totally not interested in that. In fact, half the time I'll fuss at him because I'll call his phone and he won't answer. Um, <laughs> he loved, he went with me coon hunting from the time that he was little. And uh, he in uh, November of twenty of two thousand and nine, he won the AKC Florida State Youth Championship with Jetta, and he won All the right. Coon Squall. He also won the Coon Squalling contest. <laughs> <laughs> um, he he loved it, but uh, his his love now is fishing. He works at a marina. He's working on getting his uh, captain's license. Oh, uh, that's owner great. of the marina. He's been there quite a while, and he's good at, at what he does. And a lot of these fellas that have these big boats, you know, he, he'll drive them. But we don't want to go down there. It's about fishing. That's not about hunting. But Well, I love to fish. In fact, that was one of the things that drawed me uh, to – drew me? Yeah, drew, <laughs> drew me to Florida was the fishing down here. Of course, there was a woman involved too, but uh, yeah. <laughs> we won't go there either. But – uh, but anyway, yeah, the fishing's great down here. And when, uh, he gets his, uh, he becomes a captain and all, I'll have to get the information. Mm -hmm. Maybe he can put me on, on some nice red fish. Or oh, some, he can some put some you trout. on some fish. That's one thing I will say that Austin is, and I was going to tell you too, I was looking at the papers. I was telling you that Jetta was, uh, you know, Sackett Jr. top and bottom. Her mm -hmm. daddy was Elmo, and her mother was Roxanne, and Roxanne's mother's was Sandy. And Sandy went back to uh, uh, Stylish Rank. Okay, sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. Sandy's mother was a dog named Stylish Ruby. She wasn't, um, she wasn't titled. She belonged to Flynn Welch. Do you remember I do, him? I do. Okay. Well, Flynn had a dog named Cypress Lake Sack and Sal, who was directly off of Rock River Sackett, and he mm -hmm. bred her to Lipper Stylish Rank. Yeah. And that's yeah. where Ruby came from. And they bred Ruby to a local dog named Tr uh, 
he was a grand knight. His name was Tree Jamming Buck. He went. Yep. He was night. He was night heat bred. And uh, Kelly Sandy was that dog I was telling you about that Bob Dudley ended up yeah. buying. But that was the bottom side of Jetta. And then, of course, the top side was Elmo directly off of Candy and Sackett Jr. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I remember Bobby Kelly called me, and he wanted me to take uh, – he couldn't he, – he had hurt his back. And he planned to take Sandy up and hunt the – Sunshine Jamboree when they had moved it to Ufala. Remember they moved it over to Ufala, Alabama? Absolutely, I do. Yes. And so I took her up there because I, I pleasure hunted with him enough that I could call her and took her up there and uh, Daryl Geis, I don't mm -hmm. know if you know him or not, yes. he was hunting. He was hunting one of Bob Dudley's dogs and we were hunting on Bob Dudley's, some of his land and uh, I remember I drew out with that Carmen Electra dog, and I thought, well, I'm going to be beat because she was supposed to be a tough hound. She was well, indeed, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Daryl was ha hunting some dog. I can't remember his name, but it was some dog Dudley paid a lot of money for. Well, you know how sometimes your dog will just have these nights where they can't do anything wrong? Sandy put on a I think dream. I can remember that, but I'm not. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> well, no, she put ahead. on a coon tree in exhibition. Mm -hmm. She she made five trees by herself and had a coon in every one of them. She just put on. All I had to do was just sit back and call her. And we were on the bubble. And uh, Chris Skerritt, one of my fellow hunter friends from down here, knocked me off the bubble that night. But Daryl Geis was obsessed with that dog. And I told him that I was supposed to meet Bobby Kelly at the Winter Classic the next day. I was driving over from Eufaula to Albany. And he said, what does a man look like? And I told him what he looked like because I was going to give Sandy back to Bobby because he'd come up there with his wife just to um, shop, you know, buy some stuff. He couldn't hunt because his back was bothering, but he was going to come up there and look around. And you know how many people are at the Winter Classic. A few. <laughs> Daryl walked around that place until he found Bobby Kelly. Wow. Hmm. Bobby wouldn't sell the dog then, but he didn't give up. He went back and told Bob Dudley what kind of dog she was, and they drove back down to uh, where Bobby lived and, and, and finally offered him more money than he would turn down, and they ended up buying her mm -hmm. from him. And I think Bob owned her till she died. I. I saw him at a hunt in Ozark, a PKC hunt in mm -hmm. Ozark, and he still had her then, but that was, of course, mm -hmm. years ago. But Well, did um, Guess hunt the Cowie Creek Clint dog for Bob Dudley when he had him? I know that uh, Todd Norfleet up in Indiana hunted him some, but I just wonder. That wasn't the dog I drew out with. No, it wasn't okay. Clint. Um, okay. In fact, that's how Ruby ended up in Panama City. A man named Danny Lisenby had her. And Danny knew Bob Dudley when he had Clint. Mm -hmm. And the plan was, when this is what Flynn wanted him to do, when Ruby came into heat, he wanted him to take him up and breed her to Clint. And for some reason, that didn't take place. And I'm not sure why, but she was still in heat. And uh, Buck, Shane Martin's dog, Tree Jam and Buck, was a uh, mm -hmm. super stake sire, and that's what they wanted to breed her to sure. a super stake right. sire. So that's how they ended up breeding to Buck, but that's why Ruby was even here right. at the time. Well, let me ask you this, Martha. Are you still actively hunting? Do you go at all? No. Um, we had some horrible things happen here. Mm. Uh, we started, we bought in 10 acres out in the country. And uh, we built a house out here. I know. I've seen and, it on a beautiful place. Oh, thank you. Well, we got our certificate of um, occupation um, September the 28th. I bought my homeowner's policy September the 1st and October the 10th. No, I'm sorry. We got our certificate of residency October, September the 28th and bought our homeowner's policy. October the 1st. October the 3rd, they named Michael, and October the 10th, it hit. Mm. And it destroyed everything. Panama City, we didn't have a hospital. We didn't have a 
power pole still up. All 10 acres of my trees came down. I didn't have a pine tree left. I had some damage to my house. The kennels were destroyed. I had Jetta in the house, Jetta and Tucker in the house with me when it hit, but um, it took us a year. What does it feel like? Now, I I have only been through one hurricane since I've lived Mm -hmm. down here, and that was Irma, and it ended up kind of veering. It was coming up our way, up the Gulf, uh, mm-hmm. But it veered inland and all, and really we didn't get, you know, I had a lot of limbs down in the yard, but that was about it. What was that like to live through that? We, did you stay at home or did you evacuate? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were in North Bay County, up in an area they call Bayou George, and it's on a bayou up here. And <clears throat> I'm far enough from the coast, I thought we'd be fine. My husband and I, you know, brand new, well-built house. He's a contractor, so he mm. built the house himself. And mm. thank God for that because he overbuilt it. Right. You know, if it called for this much bracing, he put that much bracing. I mean, he, it was a very well-built house. But we'd ridden out up to a, a Category 3, you know, inland and, and mm-hmm. never had a problem. But not nothing, nothing prepared us for Michael. They, the meteorologist said there's ever only ever been two storms that were still intensifying when they came ashore. You know, most of the time when a yeah. hurricane impacts land, they slow down a little bit. And that was Camille and Michael. Both of them, they had the pedal to the metal when they hit land. They were, mm-hmm. um, it, it took a year to climb out from under this, and you couldn't hunt the woods. I mean, it, you couldn't go anywhere. The trees were just as like pickup sticks, you know, just on top of each other. Um, it, it was a mess. So it it took a year to climb out from under that. And of course, Jetta and Tucker both were too old to hunt. And I had sort of put my coon hunting aside until we got the house built. Then I was going to try to find a puppy. In fact, I wanted to get another puppy off of Flynn's line of dogs because Flynn likes that Sackett line. And he's got mm-hmm. some really good dogs. And I was going to you know, drive over to Mississippi when he had some puppies and see if I could get one of his puppies. And uh, the hurricane hit. And then after we finally started cleaning up on the hurricane, I got a cancer diagnosis. Luckily, mm-hmm. they called it early. It was just a, a routine colonoscopy. They found it. And, uh, you know, thank the Lord, uh, I was able mm-hmm. to do chemo, two rounds of chemo and radiation, and for now, I'm in remission. That's great. That's um, great. Great to hear. But I, I just haven't gotten back in it. Uh, I'm 68, and thing, you know, all the people that I used to hunt with have either passed away. Um, you know, I love. Did you ever know Jack Withers? Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, I loved Jack. I loved was, visiting with Jack mm-hmm. each year at the Winter Classic. Uh, I used to terrific stay with Jack guy. a lot. Oh, okay. I used to stay with Jack and Rhonda when I'd go up there. And, yeah. you know, he's gone. And uh, I don't know if you ever knew Dick Raymer. Yes, I did, for yeah, sure. He's gone. He was a master of hounds. Right, he and, was. He used to yeah. give all the young people in our club um workshops so to speak when they wanted to learn how to competition hunt he would take them through the rules and regulations and make sure they understood everything he did some really good workshops for the younger hunters but so many people that i i would say grew up hunting with and the final blow was when leroy eason died he had really Mm -hmm. become my hunting buddy he and my husband were in construction together and um he was just Mm -hmm. a good man and uh you know, when, when all these people were gone and these young people that hunt, the language, you know, that they use with the electronics that they use, it, it just is foreign to me in a mm-hmm. sense. Well, it is, and it's very hard for those of us who, uh, you know, didn't hunt that way or conduct ourselves that way or whatever. You know, it was always a thing about coon hunting. And we used to tell the chambers of commerce this, 
when we would go in looking for a location for a new town. I remember when I took uh, Autumn Oaks to Richmond, Indiana, mm -hmm. and, as an example, different ones. And I'd say, you can go around this fairgrounds on Sunday after everyone is pulled out. And if you can find a six pack of beer cans or bottles, I, I want you to tell me, but I will be greatly res, uh, uh, surprised if I get that report from you because we have a rule that says no alcoholic beverages and the people respect <laughs> their sport. They police themselves and they'll take care of it. Now, there may have been some in campers that we never knew about, but I use I and this is not, I'm not condemning people for having a beer. It's not the point. It's the the idea that there are rules. This is a family sport, or it always was, mm -hmm. and there are certain rules, you know, that go along with it. And this thing comes up from time to time about profanity in the clubhouses. And, you know, we there was a there was a code. That no there were women and children there, and some people that were just just offended some of the other hunters that were offended by the language so it didn't happen you know no it somebody was a if, it, if somebody let out an oath or something somebody say hey and watch your language you know mm -hmm. that's not permitted here and and but but all of that is changing and, and i see that in society as a whole and when you're my age you tend to see that kind of thing a whole lot more and that's why when I started the Coon Hunting Conversations group on Facebook and uh, Alan Bridges joined me as an admin, we said, you know, no profanity on here right. and uh, no, no buying or selling. And that was just to keep people from junking the site up, you know, with a lot of stuff. And we wanted right. to talk coon dogs there, you know, it was the idea. But I get it, uh, Martha. You know that why that would would be uncomfortable, and if if these younger hunters can tell me how that improves our sport or helps it in any way, I'll sit in and I listen. I'll be spec yeah. uh, skeptical, but I will. I'll listen to them. But yeah, it it times have changed for sure. Well, I'm you know I don't knock it, but I I. I grieve for them because I think that what the electronics has replaced is they're losing that ability to have that connection with their dog. You know, it's like an invisible thread. Your dog may be in the woods a mile away, but if you can hear them, there's a thread. You know mm -hmm. what your dog's doing. That dog's talking to you. He's telling you. You know, this track's getting hotter. I'm getting excited. And then I've jumped this coon, and he's running. Um, you know, he's going up a tree. I'm locating. You know, you you don't have to depend on, on a machine to tell you that. And I think that if you if you lose that because you're so dependent on the electronics, to me, that's the, the thing that drew me. And mm -hmm. maybe it was because I had that bird hunting time in my childhood where I could visibly watch a, a pointer work a field. Oh, and, yeah. Um, you know, tell by his excitement that he was getting close to the bird and then he'd hit that point and just, you know, and that that's a beautiful thing as a dog oh, on is, point. For sure. But, uh, you know, well, even though the coon hounds, you couldn't see them, but there was still that connection. And I think that if you don't have that, that that's what drew me to coon hunting mm -hmm. that co that partnership with your dog well you know even from my earliest writing days and i've always enjoyed writing i was never a journalism student or a, an english student as far as that goes but i always like to kind of create the mood that i felt when i was in the outdoors with my with my dog you know, and I, mm -hmm. I probably overdid it in the early days, but talking about the leaves crunching underfoot, 
you know, and the smell of guns, uh, gun powder and, and oil on that shotgun that I cradled under my arm and, and, you know, the, the dog work and, and all of that, as you, that you mentioned, um, there was a deep, as you say, connection to all that. Mm -hmm. And I honestly, I think I'd be, you know, pretty accurate to say that the younger hunters don't feel that. I think I it's the idea of getting out there and how many did we tree and there he is and let me see how quick I can get this on Facebook. I don't have time to talk to you guys after the hunt, sit around and fellowship a little bit and all. I got to go home and get this video uh, uploaded so right. I can uh, brag about how many coons my dog treed. And other than that, you know, my Facebook friends are my are the only friends I have in the sport. I was encouraged when I talked to J.R. Gray uh, oh, two or three episodes ago. And mm -hmm. he talked about all his buddies there in in Kentucky at, that he hunts with, and some up in Indiana, and how they all go together, and uh, and uh, how his one friend Micah Ayers would call and say, "If there's room on the bus, I'd like to go tonight," you know, with you boys. Mm -hmm. And so it is encouraging to see that there are some groups still getting together. And I think that's probably more than anything else is the reason that I go to the White River every fall with mm -hmm. Nub and Moore that we talked about and other other hunters, uh, you know, that friends that, that I've made through that hunt is simply the fellowship. And the yeah. best of times are when the hunt's over and we're back at the lodge and we're sitting around, we get a snack and we... We sit back in those nice big overstuffed chairs and we talk about what happened uh, uh, on the hunt that night. And then we talk about old dogs that we remember and hunters we remember. And, and that conversation just kind of flows through that whole seven or eight days, you know. Right. And it's just such a, a an amazing thing, really. It is. Uh, to it experience, is. you know, and, and I just, I don't know how we can encourage <laughs> the young people to try to communicate more with their friends, to be, uh, to see, you know, more than just the superficial top layer of the sport, you know. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's like I said, it's a different generation um, and they've got to find their own way in this and i hope the sport continues um well i do too there are a lot of things that threaten it you know number one being a place to run the dogs is probably the most serious threat that we have to it yeah and then of course little by little the animal rights people will attack as they have with the big game dogs and so forth mm -hmm. around the country and yeah. I, I don't know how long it'll be until the raccoon, you know, a raccoon's a little f furry, fluffy animal to a lot of people. So, uh, you know, it's only a, a matter of time, I guess. I guess the raccoon's <laughs> its own worst enemy, though. They can make themselves such a nuisance, you know, yeah. to farmers and the, around the cities and the trash cans and all. But I don't know. We just hopefully uh, hope that it will. You right. know, I wanted to ask you just to kind of paint a, a, a picture here for mm -hmm. uh, the audience about what it's like to hunt in Florida. You know, we go up to the Midwest. I don't know if you've hunted Indiana or Illinois or Ohio or Michigan. I've hunted, um, I, yeah, when I hunted the PKC World Hunt, Okay. the satellite club was Smithville. Yeah, Smithfield, and, uh, yeah, Smithfield, right. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we hunted off the uh, near the Cumberland River, mm -hmm. up on on the Ohio Kentucky border, and I remember telling the guide, "Oh my goodness, if I could hunt this, I I would never get anything done at home. I'd be hunting <laughs> every night." <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I hunt some of those big cornfields along those river bottoms. And, and it was stuff. beautiful. Oh, yeah, for sure. All right, well, okay, take us on a typical, okay, summertime's coming here. 
a well, summer night in Florida. What okay. what's it like? Well, like I said, when I met Leroy Eason, he'd hunted Florida all his life. He'd never hunted anywhere but Florida. And what I had been doing before I met him was I like to hunt the cypress ponds. Now, a cypress pond, you know, a lot of people think, why would you want to go in a cypress pond? But you get in a pond and it's clean. It's easy walking once you get in the pond, as long as it's not too deep. It's not bad at all. And that's primarily the area I hunted around Sandy Creek. That was where I hunted. Well, let's explain the cypress pond a little bit, because I think for a lot of people around the country, you say pond, they're thinking a, a big di- uh, uh, stock tank, as they call them in Texas, or a, a body of water that you perhaps yeah. fish in and all. But a, describe a cypress pond. Okay. Well, the land that we hunted here was all paper company land. So they had cut down all the hardwood trees that were indigenous to this area and planted them with slash pines or pulpwood pines for the. Um, uh, paper mills around here and you had the drainage you wanted to keep the ground underneath these pine trees they were up on high ground and the ground would slant in other directions so most of the rainwater would um, gather in these uh, I call it runoffs so the pines mm-hmm. were up high and dry and they were ponds in the sense that they had water in them most of the time, unless you had really dry conditions. It wasn't deep. If you had a lot of rain, it might be, you know, you'd be walking on your tiptoes and they'd be just at the level of your waders. Sometimes they'd go over your waders, but most of the time it wasn't over your waders. But you'd walk through the pine trees to get to the pond and it'd be thick. You'd have a lot of blackberry bushes and got your vines and like you said tie-dye and and all manner of stuff but once you broke through all that and got into the pond there wasn't a lot of underbrush because you had water in it all the time so it was clean it was easy walking you're waiting but it was it was Mm -hmm. nice and clean and so what you do is you'd ride down the dirt road and find a little ditch little creek that emptied into one of these ponds and there was always coons in those areas and you just turn your dog in and they'd usually tree sometimes they'd push them out of the pond and up into a pine tree and uh, i'm telling you you try one of the hardest places to me to find a coon is in the top of a pine tree um, especially if they don't want to look but um absolutely yeah when i met leroy eason he hunted the coast, and I had never hunted those areas. Um, West Bay Point over in Southport was an area. It was uh, a big point of land that went out into the bay. There was a lot of estuaries and bayous, and we hunted the marsh in the summertime. Uh And the reason we did that is the moccasins, they prefer fresh water instead of salt water. So if you kept your dog out there on those tidal flats, the marsh grass and those little, I call them uh, tidal flat islands, little pine right. islands that right. are all out in there, most of the time you you wouldn't have to worry too much about snakes in the summer. Mm-hmm. Um, we'd see some gators every now and then, but those gators that were in those tidal flats It's almost like a different species. They're not your big gators that you get in the rivers. Mm -hmm. They're a smaller, lighter colored gator. And I never had them bother the dogs. Uh, Do you think it's the salt water that makes a difference? It might. It Mm -hmm. might. They're in that brackish water. They just, Mm -hmm. now I've had some friends that had dogs, um, you know, have some bad encounters with gators up in the rivers. Oh, yeah. Around here, like over by Tallahassee, mm-hmm. the Alachne River and Apalachicola River. But I never had a problem with them um, in the areas that we hunted out in the marsh. You'd see them, but I, I never had them bother mm-hmm. a dog. But where the marsh, where the soul grass gets to the pine trees, there's always a game trail because that's what the deer do. They walk along that area between the soul grass and the pine trees. So it's easy, kind of easy walking, really. Mm-hmm. We just uh, walk out into that marsh and follow the 
uh, those game trails until we got even with the dogs and then just cut in there to where they were. Um, like I said, hunting Florida, if you stand on the side of the road and just look at it, you'd never want to go in there. Right. But once you learn how to navigate it, how to go in there and pick your spots where you can get in, um, it's really not that bad. Right. I think it's just like any other state. It's just a learning experience. You just have to learn how to navigate to in and out. But You know, you as know, I, being a transplant down here, and I'll have to say as you're talking there, I'll agree with you wholeheartedly. And really, you know, we talk about it being thick and all this and all, but really the, the main thing that I've learned to try, I mean, that, that causes me consternation, I guess, is the heat. You know, it's very hot and humid here, and especially in the summertime. It uh, is. Uh, and it's just not a lot of fun, you know, when you're out there and uh, you're wiping the sweat out of your eyes. And uh, and then, of course, I, I went out uh, with, uh, on a night hunt cast here back about a year ago and uh, stepped out of the truck. Uh, we had a guide and r- immediately it was, it seemed like there were uh, a- electric machinery running everywhere from the buzzing of the mosquitoes. And there mm-hmm. were so many mosquitoes and I knew I wasn't going to be walking along on that cast. My buddy Mac uh, was, was handling my dog and, so I just jumped back in the truck as quick as I could and, and turned it. So it, it, it's difficult to enjoy the sport uh, when it's so hot uh, for yeah. me anyway. Well, I grew up in probably one of the hottest places in the United States, I would think, is Dothan, Alabama. Mm. It's literally in a bowl. It's mm-hmm. kind of a low spot, and, and, and they call it the wiregrass area, and it's mm-hmm. known for peanuts. We had yep. to, but we don't have the sea breeze in Dothan mm. like we do here in Panama City. So it's just stagnant, humid, like a blanket of heat. Mm-hmm. And when I was growing up, we didn't have central air. You had a little window unit that we usually just ran at night so you could sleep comfortably because during the day, everybody was outside. My mother would sit out in the shade shelling peas with a big mm-hmm. old glass of iced tea. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you just didn't you just didn't stay in the house in, That's in the, right. during the day. That's right. But uh, the heat's never really bothered me that much. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a couple of places around here in Panama City that, have their own concoctions. I know there's a place over in Apalachicola that uh, makes their own mosquito dope. Mm. And some of this stuff works pretty good. Um, You know, and you just slather yourself down with (laughs) mosquito repellent and, you know, just, I don't know. It's just something you, you get used to, you know, I loved it. I wanted to do it. I wasn't going to sit at home just because of mosquitoes and heat. I just, uh, a lot of times too in the summer, um, and this was always a nice thing because, you know, you always worry when you hunt by yourself. The only worry I ever used to have, I had a vest and I'd always take a flashlight with me is that your light would go out. Right. Uh, I used to have a Cajun Stinger Mm -hmm. Pro, and I loved that because that thing would hold a charge for a long time. It was a belt light. Right. And, uh, but I always had a flashlight. But in the summer, what I like to do is get up about one o'clock in the morning and hunt till daylight. That was mm-hmm. the coolest time yeah. to do any hunting. And, uh, you know, early in the morning, it seemed like the mosquitoes had done all their chewing early in the <laughs> night and they were about ready to go to bed. So yeah. it wasn't quite as bad yeah. hunting early in the morning. So right. that was something I like to do. Well, I did that too in Michigan. Michigan's a very humid state too. You got all the lakes around and every low area, there's standing water and uh, mosquitoes abound up there. They really are healthy. And uh, when I would get a dog ready for plot days, which was basically my world hunt every year, I could go to plot days and hunt my dogs in the all plot hunt because it wasn't UKC licensed. 
and therefore I was allowed to hunt in it. I couldn't hunt in the licensed UKC hunts because of conflict of interest. But at mm-hmm. any rate, I would do that. I would get up, you know, I'd come home from work. I would I'd send my wife off to Florida <laughs> with my son where her mother lived and mm-hmm. for the summer, and I'd hunt every night, but I did just what you're saying. I would set the clock for about 2 o'clock. And I'd get up and I'd go and I'd hunt till daylight and then go in and, you know, get a shower and eat and go to go to work, you know. But, mm-hmm. yeah, but I never, you know, back in the day when I was younger and 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 more energy and all, I didn't I didn't mind that heat that bad at all, you know. Mm-hmm. But nowadays it seems like it does take a toll on me. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I had thought about getting a puppy and just doing some training, you know, for other mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Um, Chris Sterrett, who's right. still a friend of mine, he still hunts and he likes, he doesn't like to train a dog. He'd rather get a dog already trained. Right. And, you know, I've kind of knocked around because I like training. Uh, I like seeing that light bulb go off on young dogs. Um, but the problem is here, DeSantis has done such a good job with our state and made it very attractive. People are moving <laughs> to the Panama City area. I mean, we've got subdivisions going up mm. everywhere. So we're kind of in a crunch now. And uh, we just lost the mill. 90 years we had a paper mill in Panama City and they just shut it down. You know, 500 wow. employees without jobs and all the loggers and pulp wooders and everybody that made their living with that. I don't know what they're going to do or what's going to happen mm. with the land. St. Joe Paper Company, you know, they still allow hunting on their land. Um, it's all lease land now. You have to be on the lease. But most of the lease owners are OK with people coon hunting because all it takes is one deer hunter to go look at his game camera and see 47 coons on their corn feeder. <laughs> they really don't care if we go in there at night and clean yeah, up some coons. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, I have the same experience down here. My first experience in Florida was in the 60s uh, when I went to college in Lakeland. And I there, there was nothing but ranches, cattle ranches, and orange groves as far as you could see in every direction. Now there's nothing but shopping centers, condos, apartment yeah. buildings, new single-family homes, um, the north of Tampa on along uh, the highway that runs east and west here through Newport Ritchie. Uh, it, it's incredible the amount of construction that's going on. Yeah. And... Uh, I hear that Florida is now the third most populous state in the, in the union. So I don't doubt it. Yeah. So those days are <laughs> are behind us, but there still are places that if you it's who you know down here. Right. You got to know somebody to get in. And so many of the leases down here are deer leases and well, the best time to coon hunt in the wintertime, they don't want you hunting because they're hunting deer in there, you know. Yeah. So it's a challenge. Well, you know, I went, I, I printed off the Internet a copy of that study they did at Clemson University yes. on how raccoon hunting does not impact deer. Correct. And um, I gave that out to a bunch of lease presidents a couple of years, well, several years ago. And said, look, we don't want your deer. I could care less about your deer. I, you know, my husband's on a deer hunting lease. And if I want to shoot a deer, I can go sit in his stand with him and do that. Um, but I, I just need a place to coon hunt at night. I'm not going to be in here poaching. And, and most of the time, we really haven't had problems mm-hmm. getting access to that. Uh, Louis Roberson, who used to be the director for the um, our region for the Game and Fish. All right. We worked a lot with Louie to get uh, access to coon hunting to a lot of the um, water management and state management land. And uh, we're lucky because we have the Apalachicola National Forest and Tate's Hell up here. And Mm -hmm. both of those areas also allow coon hunting. So as long as we have those places, we have have places to hunt. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, the biggest part of land that we had over here in Panama City, like I said, was St. Joe Paper Company. Right. So um, I don't know with the mill closing what they will do with all this land. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, you mentioned uh, two good friends of mine that I enjoyed so many years hunting with prior to the UKC Winter Classic, and that's, of course, Johnny Brinkley and Jake Lewis. Uh, mm-hmm. Jake it was from Port St. Joe. Right. Uh, I haven't talked to Joe, uh, to Jake in, in quite a while. Uh, I know that ho- whole area was devastated by Michael. Oh yeah. Uh, Mexico beach was wiped out. I yeah. Mean, it, it just wasn't even there anymore. Incredible. I just wonder if any hunting, uh, you know, when that, I think it was, uh, Hugo, that went up the East Coast, uh, up through South mm-hmm. Carolina years ago. Right. Just totally devastated that area for coon hunting for many years. And that you just here simply, too. yeah. And I just wonder, you know, how. And also, uh, back, in, back in the fall, we had horrible fires here. And what mm-hmm. it was was all that down timber. Mm hmm. In these heavily forested areas where there's no development, St. Joe had never gone in and cleared that. I mean, it it really, eventually, the, that pine will rot mm-hmm. and new growth will take its place. But they had never cleared that. And we had a real dry area from, say, August to November. And then we had some horrendous fires. In fact, I think the Calhoun... Gulf County, Bay County, because it was three different counties, was one of the largest wildfires Florida ever had. Um, and that that did harm to a, a bunch of hunting land, too. And it's still, from what I've talked to some of the friends that have tried to hunt around here, you know, you're still climbing over down trees to go to the tree. Oh, yeah. It still makes it very, very hard. And as you get older, you know, I... I... Nubbin Moore and I are planning a bear hunt for this fall up in in the state of Maine, mm-hmm. and of course we have to be selective as to where we go, or uh, so that we can negotiate the ter- terrain and all. And uh, as you get older, that becomes a problem. You know, it used to be mm-hmm. that uh, I would just climb over, under, through, whatever, <laughs> and go mm-hmm. on. You know, but. I have been in areas where there's been tremendous wind damage uh, in Michigan from straight line winds, and it's just mm-hmm. almost impenetrable. You know, you just yeah. can't get through it, and and that's a that's really a bummer. But Mother Nature, you know, is going to throw those curves at us, and somehow we just have to figure out a way, I guess, to keep going. Martha, right. it's been terrific. To visit with you, I, as as kind of uh, two things I'd like to do. Number one, if there's a young person move, say they're one of these people that are moving into Florida, and they want a coon hunt in Florida, what kind of advice would you give them? Well, you need to start out with the dog that's got a good handle on, because given the terrain that we've got right now, because of some of the storms and 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 because there's not that many people, at least up here, that are doing a lot of coon hunting. Um, you're not going to have the advantage that I did to have a lot of older people that will take you under their wing and help you. So a lot of it's going to be maybe you and two or three other of your friends that want to try it. You need to have a dog, and an old, uh, and you may have to pay a little bit more for this, but you want to ha- start out with a dog that knows a lot more than you do, a dog that knows what it's doing, a dog that's got a good handle on it. Because if you start out with a dog that doesn't know what it's doing and you don't know what you're doing and that dog's running deer, um, leaving the tree, uh, this type of thing, it's going to, you're going to lose interest real quick, especially here in Florida. Yeah. But if you've got a solid coon dog, with a good handle that you can pick and choose where you're going to go. A dog that's straight, it's not going to run off game. It's going to probably tree in the area where you turn him loose and you can go in and see the raccoon. That's going to spark your interest. 
So I think that's the first thing you need to do, even if you have to cough up some money to do it, is find you a good, solid coon dog to get started. Let him teach you. I think that's great, great advice. Now I'm going to spring one on you here a little bit. We didn't talk about this earlier. Do you recall or have a favorite story of your in memory of your years of coon hunting here in Florida? <clears throat> Let me think about that. I have so many. I think one of the funniest. Okay. Um, it was in Albany, Georgia, and they were having the RQE up there. And Arnold Moore, of course, was the hunt director for that. And they were having a hard time because back then you had to have two non-hunting judges. Right. And they were having, a, and I had, I had gone up there. I was staying with Jack. And, and I, I was, was that be, crazy guy up in Michigan that was sitting behind a desk <laughs> <laughs> causing well, you guys all this grief. <laughs> well, what they were doing was him and Jimmy Phillips is they were picking a, a strong judge mm -hmm. and then putting it with somebody that wasn't, maybe didn't know exact, maybe they hadn't judged a lot, but they were an honest person and mm -hmm. and they could be back up for the stronger judge. Right. So that's what they were doing. And I was paired with a guy who was a Georgia State Trooper, or retired. I think he was a retired Georgia State Trooper. And uh, they called the cast, and he showed up. And um, <laughs> it was so funny, he didn't know any better. He opens up his uh, ice chest, and he says, I brought some refreshments for when we go hunting. And he had some beer in the cooler. <laughs> We had to tell him, uh, no, I'm sorry, but we, we, it's no alcoholic beverages during a, uh, a UKC hunt. That that was funny. That was one of the funniest things. And the look on Arnold's face was like, mm, uh, I don't think so. That was funny. Your uh, story reminds, maybe you have another one and I don't want to interrupt, but your story reminds me of when I was a field rep and uh, I was assigned to go up to the eastern shore of Maryland, uh, mm -hmm. Cecil County, Maryland, which was a very active club back in the day, and it's right on the Chesapeake Bay. And I pull into the grounds on a, but typically, you know, I would travel there, get up real early from my home in West Virginia and drive, and, and some days maybe have to go the day before. But anyway, I'd roll into the club, you know, early afternoon and see how, you know, things were set up for taking entries and all that stuff. And so I pulled into the grounds, and uh, there was a pickup truck there with several guys uh, uh, standing around, you know, talking, as coon hunters do. And as I pulled up, uh, I went over and I said, uh, you know, I'm, I told them who I was and why I was there and all good to meet them and all. And he popped open the cooler and handed me a long neck. And he said, uh, man, it's hot today here, man. Have one of these. <laughs> I, said, I said, man, we, we've we got a rule here <laughs> that's going to make that hard to do. We we can't have any alcoholic beverages. Right. And he says, oh, no, no, it'll be fine. He says, "We it, that's what we do up here on the eastern shore. Mm -hmm. we, we eat crabs and we drink beer. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, we're going to just have to forego that beer part yeah. for the next few hours, right. but I do appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, they just, and, and you know, that was it. That turned out to be a funny night all the way around. I mean, you know, that happened, and he, he was real chagrin over that. We're like, it's okay, you didn't know. But then we go and we draw out, and uh, there was a fellow that was hunting a black and tan, and he had a buddy with him. And we turned loose, and there was a pond, and the guy said something to the effect, it was a big cow, cow pasture, because we were in Albany. And the guy goes, you know, there's some gators over here, and this is more like a lake, I think. Not, not a cypress pond. This was a real pond. And uh, the buddy of the guy hunting the black and tan said, oh, watch this. And he starts, he's a, he's a black guy. He starts making a noise, I guess, like a gator would make. Hmm. And all of a sudden, here come these gator eyes coming over there to where we were. And we're oh, like, nice. I wish you hadn't done that. <laughs> we're fixing to turn some dogs loose here. It was just a funny night oh, all the way around. Man. 
<laughs> Only in, well, that was Georgia there. Yeah, that was in Albany. Yeah, well, they got yeah. plenty of them up there, too. Yeah, they do. <laughs> in but South Carolina and all over. <laughs> Yeah. Bruce Gillum, I think. And it's yeah. Gillum. Yeah, uh, black yeah, and tan. black yeah. and tan guy. Yeah, it yeah. was a, a guy that was with him um, mm -hmm. was doing that. He was on my cast that night. <laughs> yeah, Bruce is a guy that I got to know quite well when I went to PKC. Uh, he was actively hunting PKC at that time. His dad, Another. Johnny, is a, is a well-known black mm -hmm. and tan man, coon hunter. Another hunt I remember, uh, it was an RQE in Panama City, and uh, a guy named Junior Hagler and I were the two non-hunting judges for that. And uh, we had two females on our cast. I have never forgotten them. One of them was Yellow River Cookie. I'm trying to remember the other one's name. Anyway. Was that a red bone dog? No, she was, a, he was, a, it was two walker dogs. Okay, um, okay was Yellow River Cookie, and I'll probably remember the other one in a minute, but usually in Florida, you're not going to have big scores like you do up in the Midwest. You know, you're happy sometimes to come back with 250-plus points. Sure. But these, do these dogs, we'd turn them loose, and one would tree over here and one would tree over there, and they'd have a coon. Then we'd turn them loose again, and same thing, all night long. These dogs did that. Uh, and we were just, we were amazed. Um, also, Homer's Gomer came to yes. Southport, to our club in Southport one year, and chalked up like a 600 and something uh, points, mm -hmm. which was the first. I think he probably, if we kept a record, if the Southport club had kept a record, Gomer probably had the record for the most plus points ever mm -hmm. scored out of that club. Did you get to hunt with Gomer? No, I was not okay. on that cast. I just mm -hmm. every what um oh what was his name that owned that dog? Well, I'm you're you're embarrassing me here, Martha, because I should was know it? that I know he was I, I believe he was a uh, Wimp Aaron bred dog, I believe, from Mississippi. Yeah, but he was. He was a but, schooner river dog, but yeah. He, that, was it Albert Vining that owned it? It could very well be. I think he was a friend of the Parkers because that's why he ended up coming down to that. It was a, an RQE, and he was trying to get him qualified. I see. Mm -hmm. I uh, anyway, I, he uh, from what I've heard, he was a tremendous tree dog. Um, yeah. But, uh, um, the year I went to the World Hunt, uh, Schooner River Fred. Mm -hmm. hunted that year that I yeah. was up there. And a friend of mine from Alabama was on that cast, and he said, man, when that dog hit a tree, those trees shook. <laughs> <laughs> Fred was a good tree like, dog. In fact, uh, my, my dog. friend uh, Eric Fairchild up in Michigan and a fellow named Brian Gray uh, mm -hmm. owned a Fred there for a, a time and sold him to uh, – to uh, Kurt uh, Seibert and I mm -hmm. believe Fred Bodenbaugh there in Ohio. And of course, they advertised Fred extensively. And Fred was a tremendous tree dog. And of course, he mm -hmm. figured very strongly in the uh, pedigree of, of Bone Collector, who mm -hmm. everybody in the, in the hound world knows. Uh, but uh, well, Martha, uh, yes, go ahead. One other question. I, I was going to ask you, because this was a person I always envied, is talk about being a female hunter. Do you ever hear from Vicki Lamb? What's she doing uh, now? As far as I know, Vicki Lamb is still writing. I don't know mm -hmm. that she's doing anything with coon hunting. I have seen her on social media. I believe she's still very much involved in her retrievers. Uh, right. She's I mean, she a retriever trainer. Right. But, uh, yeah, Vicki, uh, listeners uh, may remember, and those of you who weren't around back then, v Vicki was very active in competition hunting uh, yeah, she back was. in the day. She had Durango the year I hunted in the PKC World Hunt. She was up there. She had that blue dog, blue Durango. Dog. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Her husband, Jerry, had uh, had uh, 
Blue Dogs, and I think that mm-hmm. was probably the influence on that. Well, mm-hmm. Martha, we have been at it an hour and 40 minutes. Oh, wow. I'm it, sorry. <laughs> no, don't be sorry at all. It's been great conversation. I always, when we do have a good uh, a good conversation, try to uh, convince the, the guests to come back again, and I'd certainly like for you to do that because I'm sure there's a lot of stories that we haven't covered and all, but it's been a really great visit with you. And, well, thank uh, you. I enjoyed it. Do you have any coon hounds at home anymore? No, no. Jetta passed away. She mm-hmm. was 16, um, and that was my last one. And like I said, after, uh, that was right after the hurricane. And uh, we've just been trying to get things cleaned up and back in place. And then I had to go through all my cancer treatment. Oh, yeah. So I'm finally back on my feet now and the house is back to Mm. back to normal. And I have been sort of hitting around the idea of of getting a puppy and just doing some training. I've still got a um, place that I can hunt. I've got a good friend that's president of a lease and I know that I could get on there without any problem. Um, So I've kind of thought about doing that well i hope that you can because and also i hope that you'll stay involved in the sport because you have a tremendous amount of knowledge and great recall and uh, a lot of good uh advice and uh you know you mentioned uh, mr raymer dick mm-hmm. i believe right yeah and you mentioned about how he did this course for the young people Right. He, he used to do that uh, rules workshop is what we call it. Right. And I hope that those listeners out there that are involved uh, with the youth, I think about uh, uh, Jeff uh, Robertson down there in uh, North Carolina, for, for an example. And mm-hmm. I know my good friend Tyler Duncan, who has the Coon Hunting University podcast, has also been very supportive of youth events and so forth. I hope that they're listening and will maybe take that idea and uh, and go with it because I think that's an excellent way to teach the young people. You know the fundamentals, mm-hmm. just like sports, any sport. You got to learn the fundamentals. Right. And uh, but uh, Martha, I have a little closing line that I always do when we close off one of these things. It's been a great visit with you. I certainly wish you the best. Hope to talk to you again soon. And if anybody asks you, where is Steve Fielder? You tell them he's gone to the dogs. Okay. Thank you, Steve. And I appreciate it. I appreciate the honor of being on your program. Well, you are most welcome.